Hello, everyone. Welcome to our recording of the business safety presentation. My name is Stephen Quinn. I'm a community safety liaison on the neighborhood empowerment team. Go ahead, Kenny. My name is uh, Kenny McKinnon, and I work with the community engagement team for the Edmonton Police Service. All right, so thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, as this is a recording, um, we just ask that if you have any questions, please email them to us. We will uh, have our emails at the end of the presentation. Um, and to start with a land acknowledgement. So let us respectfully acknowledge that we are all located on Treaty 6 territory, which is traditional lands for many Indigenous peoples whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. These lands are home to the Black, Blackfoot, Assiniboine, Chippewan, Beaver, Nakoda, Cree, Métis, and other Indigenous peoples. For thousands of years, they flourished, traded, and held ceremonies on these lands. Our recognition of these lands and my fellow Indigenous peoples is an act of reconciliation and an expression of our gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and visit. All right, so the purpose of this presentation is to have a conversation regarding crime and social disorder concerns affecting uh, your business. Um, we would like to keep this interactive. Um, although this is a um, recorded presentation, feel free to send anything at the end uh, if you have any questions or concerns or comments. Um, you'll see on your screen there, there is a QR code. And if you open up on your phone, um, your camera, and point it towards that, um, that code, a survey should pop up on the screen and you can fill that out um, about your uh, knowledge around uh, business safety prior to this presentation. And then it will say stop. And at the end, you will have um, an opportunity to fill it out um, after the presentation is completed and all feedback there is, is very much appreciated. If it doesn't work on your phone for some reason, there is a link right below um, that QR code. Um, feel free to uh, put that into your browser and that will populate the survey as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to, uh, an increased understanding uh, and what contributes to um, business safety and share concrete strategies to address crime and social disorders. So just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to chat about the neighborhood empowerment team, um, strategies to promote safety, architecture, natural surveillance, natural access control, territorial reinforcement, maintenance, security strategies, company policies, back alley safety, community-based approaches, personal safety. We'll go over a business scenario um, from the 24-7 crisis diversion team, and then we'll chat about some resources and some uh, important contact information. So jumping right in, the Neighborhood Empowerment Team is a collaborative partnership between four partners. Our work focuses on crime prevention and reduction, focusing on personal safety, property safety, community safety, and business safety. Uh, even though we have four main partners, communities like yours are our biggest partners as our work is community driven. We cannot do this work successfully without your active involvement. So thank you for tuning in today and, and being here and listening to us. It is you that knows the best um, about your community and the issues uh, within your communities and have a better understanding about what might work best to address these issues. And I like to say that you are the own, your own expert in each community. And that's been around for 20 plus years. And even though the way our teams work has changed over the years, the main focus Partnerships are very important as it is a recognition that we need other strategies to address, address crime and social disorder besides the enforcement. Members and building relationships and learning about what's important to them in their communities. All right. So, uh, Many of the strategies that we're sharing with you today are based off uh, the principles of crime prevention through environmental design. In short, it's called SEPTED. We focus on modifying the building, social, and natural environment uh, to promote safety. This is based on the premise that the environment can have a dramatic effect upon your feelings and hence our perce uh, perceptions of safety and behaviors. 
the environment can also affect, uh, have an effect upon our perceptions and behaviors of others. Therefore, if we can change the environment, it will impact what behavior will occur in that particular place. Go on to the next slide. Did it, uh, did it go to the next slide, Kenny? Not yet. Uh, sorry, I just had a few pop-ups here. Uh, let me try that again. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So users of space. Uh, when talking about septed principles, we look at users of space, who, uh, the users of space, who is using the space and for what purpose. In any space, there can be three different types of users. Legitimate users is a person you desire to be in that, in that certain place, who uses the space for what it's intended for. For example, uh, going to a superstore to buy groceries. That would be a use of the of the space and what it's actually meant for. Non-legitimate users. So this is a person that you do not desire to be in the space uh, because of whatever disruptive activity they may be doing or not using the space for what it's designed for. And then there's observers. Persons who are in that space observing what is happening, other people um, who are using that space are, are also observers. Having observers in a place promotes safety because usually criminals do not want to be observed when conducting criminal activity. When we think of these users, we think about the time of day. Most businesses do not oper operate 24 hours, and as such, you might uh, not, uh, not have observers of a place at certain times, hence the use of video surveillance uh, to provide observation, which can deter crime. Most criminals are rational actors, which, mean, uh, which means they, they think of a, a means to an end, or if there's a consequence for an action, they, uh, they won't take that action. It's important that we attract normal users and provide opportunities for observations uh, to prevent crime and social disorder. All right, so natural surveillance can enhance perceptions of safety as it improves the ability to see what is happening around you. So a few quick examples before we get into some more details. It's improving visibility with lighting or transparent building materials. And we'll chat about more, uh, more about that in a few slides. Um, avoid uh, lighting that creates glares. So light fixtures that are too widely spread or wrongly positioned uh, light fixtures can create shadows too bright of light. Um, polished, shiny, or glossy services can cause glare as well. And avoid creating building entrapment areas. So entrapment areas are small confined areas near or adjacent to well-traveled routes that are shielded on three sides by some barriers such as walls or bushes. Natural surveillance and architecture. Um, an architecture that limits opportunity for crime by enhancing the chance that, uh, for a potential offender might be or willing to be seen. The effectiveness of such measures relies on the willingness um, reacting to and or reporting that they have been seen to others to enforce the law. Uh, so there's a photo there and um, it is a great uh, example of uh, well, architecture within a building and if you were to guess Grant McEwen uh, Arts Building you are correct so as you can see there's lots of glass there you can see from the top um, to the very bottom you can see from the bottom to the top and uh, just a, a, a real ability to view what's going on around you even though you may not be on the same floor so to get into that a little bit more detail um, stairs and ramp design so you see that um, the stairs are open they're not enclosed um, there's that glass there like i had said um, parking lot or parkade designs are also important so um, are they well lit um, are there hiding spots for people to um, go into those entrapment areas that i had mentioned um, emergency phones or buttons are also uh, a great idea for uh, the architecture of the building um, including uh, parkades elevators um, there is an elevator in uh, the university hospital that's that's made up of all glass and i like to use that one as a, as an example because it was i'm assuming that it was intentionally built like that so um, 
people can see what's happening on the inside and on the outside. So if someone is to get into that elevator and to try something, um, whatever that might be, um, people on the outside looking in can see what's going on. So a great way to enhance that natural surveillance. Uh, blind spots or ambush areas. So add lighting and convex mirrors. You know, if uh, a building is already created and or built and you're looking at that natural surveillance architecture piece um, and, uh, you know, it's just not possible to uh, physically change that space, adding uh, convex mirrors and additional lighting will help um, make that space less appealing to some people. And also restrooms, um, where they're located is also uh, really important. If they're hidden um, behind in hallways, um, might not be the best. Uh, having them kind of open in the front where you can see who is going in, in and out of the, the restrooms is also a great idea. Um, and of course, interior and exterior lighting. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more after, um, but bright and LED is something that we always uh, recommend. So... Yeah, lighting is the next slide. So lighting is big and people do not want to be caught committing a crime. And if I was to choose one thing to really highlight on this uh, presentation, it would be lighting. Um, like I said, they don't want to be caught doing anything. And lighting is one of the best ways to deter someone from offending. So just general lighting, LED, like I had said, uh, it is a little bit more expensive to purchase at the beginning, but it does last longer and it, it saves uh, money as well. Um, it's not uh, really expensive to run um, and uh, you uh, you get many many years out of LED lighting. Uh, you want to make sure that you check all bulbs inside and outside of your business and also make sure that they're clean. If there's any dust or residue especially outside if uh, they're not covered um, this can decrease that lighting so you want to do uh, regular uh, cleaning and maintenance of your light bulbs if, it, if they aren't LED. Um, light placement is also important, so um, too high of lighting um, can be an issue. Um, so you want to have that uh, that balance, and and usually eight to ten meters above ground is recommended. Um, and uh, if there are is a chance where someone could throw a rock at the lighting um, within that eight to ten meters, um, a good idea would be to have some type of metal um, cage over it, just so uh, those chances of it being broken um, are decreased. Uh, outdoor, I covered the eight to ten meters. Uh, multiple outdoor lighting, so. Um, you want, to, of course, you want the front of your building to be lit up, but uh, many people forget about the sides. So um, you want to have uh, lighting on the corners of your building and at the back of the building uh, where there's entrances um, and places for people to get into. Um, the lighting is not obstructed by large vehicles, trees, or anything that uh, kind of decreases that light from doing its job. So, uh, for example, mature neighborhoods have really large trees. So um, you might want to take that into consideration if there is a tree on your property um, around your business and it does belong to you. You might want to consider um, trimming it up just to make sure that people are being seen. And, uh, and I had mentioned the mesh around uh, the light outside. Um, indoor lighting for businesses. Um, during closing hours, it is a good idea to um, keep at least one light on just to give that impression that, um, that someone might be around or someone um, may be seen uh, committing a crime. Um, and like I said, you know, just one bulb um, LED it won't cost too much over time. I'm also keeping small rooms and storage areas well lit, and this will help with preventing loss of inventory. We'll chat a little bit more about that, but I'm um, just making sure that those spaces are uh, visible and, uh, and, and lit well. Natural surveillance and visibility. So natural surveillance and visibility, um, having um, the ability to know what is occurring outside and inside of your business. So, um, you see there uh, on the top right there is a business uh, with lots of stickers and advertisements out the front. We don't recommend that. We uh, we like to say maybe 10% of your uh, windows can be uh, can have advertisements or signs and whatnot. Um, but the photo underneath that says yes with the clear glass, um, that would be ideal. Uh, that way you can see what's happening inside in case, uh, say there's a robbery, someone on the outside has that opportunity to report it. Um, and then vice versa, if you see something happening outside, the person, the people inside have that opportunity to report. Um, blinds and curtains, so um, you'd want to keep them open during the day, of course, just like those stickers or advertisements so you can see in and out. 
window signs. Um, like I said, 10% of the window uh, uh, can be covered. We, we don't suggest anything more. Um, sh shelving units within your business just to increase that natural surveillance. If you can have them a little bit lower so you can see across the room uh, uh, what's going on, um, that's ideal. If not, I have seen some uh, shops have um, mirrors at the end of each aisle and security uh, guards are, are looking at those mirrors, mirrors kind of on the side um, of the aisle and looking down the aisle. Um, that's also helpful just to increase that uh, visibility and surveillance. Um, and also cashier placement is important. Uh, you don't want to have a cashier right next to the door um, for reasons that it's uh, more accessible. Um, having the cashier placed um, more towards the, the back of the wall um, so you can, um, so that person can see everything in the shop and what's going on in the shop. And you see on the left side, there are some um, photos of uh, bushes there. And uh, we like to suggest uh, is what's known as like a two foot, six foot rule. So um, ideally to keep your bushes trimmed down to two feet, just so um, people aren't able to hide out in them or use that as a space to camp out or, or just engage in anything that you don't want around, around your business. And then the six foot rule is for larger trees, such as uh, spruce trees that are all over the city. Um, if you are able to uh, trim those up to six feet, it reduces the opportunity for someone to to, um, use that space to hide out or, or anything like that. Access control. So natural access control means controlling access to a site as people are physically guided through the space through design. The principle relies on using pathways, lighting, and other means to direct traffic and to find spaces for use. So really um, sharing with people or um, I'm telling people where they can and can't go, uh, where um, is public and where is private uh, entrances or spaces that uh, people can be. So um, in order to do that, highlighting the main entrance so it's visible, um, well lit, um, a sign um, over top of the entrance is a really great idea. Um, clearly marking walkways. So, you know, even um, solar lights around uh, their walkways so people know that's the way to go in or um, uh, signs around the grass that says do not walk on the grass or shrubs um, like in the previous picture that line the, the entrance so people know where to go. Um, if there's a space that you don't want customers to go to like side entrances or back entrances or places within the building um, an employees only sign is also um, a good idea. Uh, also lock gates and doors um, like uh, the back alley uh, gates or side gates, staff rooms, um, through rooms as well. Um, uh, security guards or greeters, um, not all of us have that opportunity to have a security guard or a greeter, um, but an alternative if, um, if that's not in the budget is have uh, staff greet uh, your customers as they walk in the door. You know, if the staff is behind the, the, um, the cashier, they can kind of yell over and say, hi, how are you? Or just so that person that's coming in the door knows that, um, that you can see them and that they're being watched. Um, it's also um, not a good idea to really fortify your, your business. You want it to look welcoming. So, you know, we don't advise barbed wire around fences or anything like that. Um, you're going to kind of have that happy medium. So people feel welcome there, but they also know that there are certain spaces that they can and can't uh, enter. Territorial reinforcement expresses ownership of the space. It's the design of an area to clearly show that someone owns the area. It suggests to criminals that a person is present um, who may see their criminal activity and report it to police. So Kenny is going to get into the um, broken window theory a little bit in one of the next slides, um, but really keeping your place um, looking uh, like someone's around there. So uh, freshly cut grass is is a uh, is a good idea. People know that uh, you're spending some time there. Pruned uh, shrubs and flowers. Um, signage, so you know, address on the front of the building, um, which is usually people are always um, having the address in the front, but the back um, alley or the back entrance. Um, some businesses do lack in that area where they don't post the um, the address, and with the address. 
being posted at the back of the building, and, and Kenny will touch on this again, um, it will um, help increase that um, response time from EPS if they do need to get into the back of the building because um, with that address, they can see where they're going. Uh, fences around, um, around the spaces that you don't want people to walk on, there's grass or um, side entrances. Um, and uh, just to touch on uh, the top left picture in the slide is uh, they have that fence um, saying that you can't go beyond there, but it's also um, a perfect fence for natural surveillance because you can see right through that fence and what's going on um, behind it. So it's also um, a great thing to have. All right. So uh, the broken wind window theory. So the broken window theory is a theory that states that visible signs of crime, antisocial behavior, and civil disorder create an urban environment that encourages further uh, crime and disorder, including serious crimes. Examples and uh, examples of this are kind of the the obvious ones: are, are broken windows, graffiti, garbage, and uh, a, a vacant building or an empty building that's not being taken care of. Um, I think we've probably all seen. Um, examples of this uh, where you see a house in a neighborhood that uh, is clearly nobody's living there all the windows are smashed out there's graffiti all over it or it's boarded up or anything like that and you can see that when uh, it's unattended or whatever that the area in and around it tends to suffer uh, because of that. so obviously taking care of your space is very important um, and uh, we can talk about some of the different pieces in that. So maintenance and upkeep of the space are closely tied uh, to, the, to the broken window theory. It states that a neighborhood in trouble, uh, or states that uh, a neighborhood in trouble uh, signals that crime is tolerated in this area. Um, it improves visibility uh, by, uh, you can improve visibility by cutting uh, down trees. Uh, so we have the two foot, six foot rule and stuff where you cut uh, branches up to six feet and cut uh, bushes down to two feet um, is generally what we uh, suggest so that again, you can observe and see what's going on in, in and around that area. Uh, some more of that maintenance uh, side of things is uh, you can always, um, uh, improve visibility by just making sure that you're repairing anything um, on the, especially on the exterior of the building. So uh, if you do end up with a broken window or burnt out light bulbs or broken uh, fixtures or any of those type of things, repair them as quickly as you can. And obviously when it comes to graffiti, we want to remove that, uh, but we'll go into that in a little bit more depth. Uh, so any uh, additional expression of ownership. So that it appears that this is, um, a well taken care of property, like uh, like Stephen was talking about, if it, if the grass is actually mowed or there's um, you know flowers or bushes or, or things that kind of beautify the space, it's well taken care of and it gives that impression that uh, that type of um, antisocial behavior or crime or disorder or any of those type of things are not tolerated here and cleaned up very quickly. We'll go on to the next one. So. Uh, general maintenance, we kind of talked about this, obviously, uh, repair any kind of damage to the exterior of your building. Um, uh, when it comes to graffiti specifically, uh, we, we use the three R rule. So record it, so take pictures of it and record the time that you noticed it or, or the time that you knew that it, it actually happened. Um, report it, so call 311 or report it through the 311 app. You can also report it online to the Edmonton Police. We actually stockpile all that information with the city, and we generally know who's doing the tagging or the graffiti for these type of events, so then we can uh, potentially look at charges on uh, later on down the line. And that uh, both of those, again, you can report online nice and uh, easy for you. And then the last one, remove it. So uh, Capital City Cleanup offers up to $750 worth uh, of professional uh, graffiti cleanup for your property. So um, it's, it's only a one-time grant and stuff, but that being said, you can get, uh, get that grant um, and then get uh, that graffiti cleaned up. Um, it, it's also generally pretty easy uh, during the, the summer months and stuff to either pressure wash it off or just uh, clean it off depending on what's been, been used. Um, on, on your property and where it's been used. Uh, so other things that you can do, um, obviously, 
um, taking care of your property in the winter time. So clearing off snow off the sidewalks or whatever is always a good idea. Not only is it um, good for your neighbors and good for their business, for people to be able to get in there without slipping or falling or any of those type of things, it also makes your property look like it's being taken care of. So the example of this would be if uh, maybe close down your your um, shop for a week or something like that or take some time off and you're not going out to it all the time and your sidewalks haven't been cleared during this time well now as a person who might be thinking of doing some type of crime or anything like that to a property it doesn't look like anybody's been to this business or been to this building or whatever in a long period of time because the snow fell yesterday and i don't see any footprints so they use that type of stuff um, and same thing with like mail or different things like that being left around uh, or left at the entry point again it doesn't have that uh, perception of being one taken care of or two that anybody's been here so um, even doing that on off days or days that maybe you're not open is always a good idea uh, anything that you can do to beautify the space or whatever obviously uh, helps so when it comes to um, spaces that are kind of being uh, maybe graffitied all the time you can put either a, a mural on a wall or dress uh, dress it up um, have some students paint it or some uh, family member paint um, things to try to again um, make it more more attractive and make it look like it's being taken care of when it comes to murals a lot of times um, art uh, graffiti and different things like that um, it, they view their work as art and they don't want to tag or destroy other people's artwork so if a mural goes up we find that that location or whatever um, uh, greatly reduces if not completely reduces the amount of tagging or graffiti that we see in those particular uh, locations the other thing you can do is use um, uh, vegetation to uh, take over a space so have those hanging vines that grow up the side of buildings or uh, push some shrubbery and stuff in place so that they can't get at a wall to tag it or graffiti it or, or something along those lines. Um, reporting the obviously the any uh, graffiti or tagging and stuff is very helpful on our side of things because again we don't have an all all seeing eye in the sky and stuff. If you don't tell us about it, we don't know what's happened and we can't try to respond to it accordingly. Um, so we would always suggest make sure that you take the time to again record, report, and then uh, the most important important part, remove it because of that broken window theory. We can go on to the next one. All right, thanks, Kenny. Um, so some community-based strategies. Now these can be uh, applied to your business as well as your home. So. Um, one of the things that we always like to suggest is to getting to know your neighbors. Uh, when I moved into um, my home several years ago, um, one of the first things I did was you know, go outside in the summer and uh, go meet people, say hello, introduce yourself, um, exchange phone numbers, which some people may not want to do, um, but I, I can tell you that uh, it is really helpful in case you know there are some suspicious people in the neighborhood, um, your, your neighbor can uh, send you a quick text or around your business and, and, and inform you of that. So it's a great way to help decrease crime and know what's occurring in your um, business community or your residential community. Um, be out and about in the community. So um, walking around the block, um, shoveling snow, of course, uh, planting flowers, just really being present and being seen. Uh, the more you're outside and engaging um, with other people outside, uh, there's more eyes on the street. And uh, as we know and, and said, um, criminals don't want to be seen. So having more of that outdoor activity um, really helps out. Uh, joining a safety committee. Um, so the community leagues uh, typically have uh, safety committees um, and they do all sorts of different things. One um, that I'm thinking of, um, they do a walk your block. So every evening a group of individuals go around and, and walk um, around the community just to see what's going on and, and just to have more eyes on the street. Um, additional to that, um, you can uh, check with the business association and see uh, if they have any um, safety initiatives as well. Uh, we do work with uh, business associations quite closely, so we are always offering um, presentations to them. This is one of the presentations that we've done to, for the BIAs um, and, uh, and also personal safety and different types of things that business owners might be interested in. 
Um, know what uh, employee uh, know what employee vehicles there are at the back and side of your business. So you know if there's a, a designated parking spot just for employees and staff, um, know who drives what just in case um, there are some people hanging out in their vehicles or there's vehicles that aren't supposed to be parked there. Um, and um, knowing the business hours of obviously uh, yourself, but um, of course your neighbors as well. So if, uh, you know, if there are uh, people hanging outside the business when it's closed or even inside of the business after hours, um, that would be a great opportunity to just inform the business owner or the staff or management that, you know, there's someone inside and, you know, I know that you close at six o'clock. Um, so I just want to let you know. Um, and then I had said the phone number thing is uh, is really great to uh, and get to the phone numbers, but also um, if you're leaving town, if you're going on holidays or something, um, you know, the people around your business can inform you of anything that's going on. So um, some security strategies. Uh, the following are ways to enhance um, safety at your business. Um, so organized security would be security officers or greeters and i had uh, used that example of uh, businesses and i believe that it's uh, the liquor depot they always say hello and greet you when you walk in the door so um, it's a great way for uh, for the customers to know that they're being seen um, foot patrol or um, property walks and scans uh, so you can uh, walk around the building before uh, it opens in the morning or the evening, whenever that is, and also in the closing hours, um, doing a walk or scan around the building just to see if there's anything going on, you know, if there's any um, garbage or anything to be cleaned up, and that's a good opportunity to pick that up and throw it away as well. Um, and this is uh, best to be done in pairs, especially at nighttime. Um, unfortunately, some businesses only run with one employee, so if you do choose to do the um, foot patrol or walk around your business, um, we suggest that you know you keep a cell phone with you and that it's charged at all times, just so you can have that extra um, blanket of security. Locking up your property, of course, is important. Um, some people are using intercom systems um, and remote entry to allow. Um, uh, customers come into their business, especially around COVID, just to control uh, the amount of people that are inside. Uh, fences, of course. Uh, so use a heavy lock. Don't use a um, like a locker lock that you may have used in high school. I may have been guilty with that at one point, um, but use a good um, hard, heavy lock um, so it's difficult to get into. Um, that way it takes more time to, to cut it open and uh, the more time spent uh, there, the, the higher chance that someone will be caught trying to get it open. Um, back and side doors locked, um, also windows locked. Uh, Additional to the windows being locked, you can get a bar to put in your window or even those metal bars that go all the way across the windows, just an added um, measure. Um, sign out system for keys. So if you have multiple staff um, and you have keys to say certain drawers or safe or whatever that might be, um, have a sign in and out system so those keys don't go missing. Um, padlocks mounted securely. Um, some people use uh, padlocks for entry or even um, to put uh, lock boxes with keys. So you want to make sure that the, the screws that are being used for those padlocks are quite long and not small, um, just so it takes more time to get into them if that does happen. Alarms, of course, are uh, a great way to help uh, keep your business safe. Um, so you want to look for uh, alarms, uh, an alarm company that's a member of the Canadian Alarm Security Association. Always like to re recommend that. Um, changing passwords quite often. Um, so when someone's no longer working there at the business, you uh, you should really be changing the password. So you know you're keeping um, that password for only people that are currently working there, and also train staff to use the alarm systems. Um, Video surveillance um, also is a great idea to have um, installed into your business inside and outside. Um, so shop around. Um, there's always some pretty good sales. There's wired um, video cameras and there's wireless as well. So those would require some charging. I do have the wireless at my home and I, I do like them quite a bit. Um, you can mount them anywhere so you don't really need a plug-in. And some of them do last quite a long time. Um, but in the winter, the, the batteries tend to uh, drain a little bit faster. So there's pros and cons. Um, 
So for uh, staff training around video surveillance cameras, um, this is also really important. And Kenny, please feel free to jump in if you like. But um, I know that um, there's been some issues where you know EPS had wanted to access uh, video surveillance cameras and unfortunately some of the staff or um, people working um, weren't able to use the video surveillance or the alarms and things like that so um, just to have a uh, faster time and uh, of catching these people um, having more people trained to use those uh, surveillance cameras um, is is definitely recommended um, and also clean cameras monthly. So especially if the cameras are outside, um, close to dusty roadways, um, cleaning those lens with uh, microfiber cloth is also a good idea just to make sure that you're getting the best uh, footage possible. Right, loss prevention. Uh, so as much as we, we wish financial losses weren't a reality, it can happen, especially during uh, pressing times. So some ways that you can try to mitigate uh, this is, is being a little bit proactive and stuff. So just doing things like displaying anti-theft signs, saying uh, shoplifting is a crime, there's video surveillance on site can help. Uh, track, tracking your inventory regularly. Um, we always suggest like daily or during each shift to have staff sign once they've completed an inventory count. That way, if uh, when they notice that there is something missing, it's not weeks of video that they're going back trying to figure out uh, when that inventory potentially was stolen um, or anything like that. It's it's a matter of a day or the past couple hours or, or something along those lines. Um, we always suggest removing larger bills from the cash register, register especially during uh, shift change. That's when they, uh, these people tend to target um, and, and do uh, robberies or, the, or, or those type of things. Ensure safe content. Uh, safe contents are uh, deposited regularly. So obviously, uh, so we will obviously don't want a huge amount of cash to sit in a safe um, at any time. So uh, whether you're taking that to the bank or anything like that, um, or you have somebody that comes and collects it for you, do that regularly um, to keep that that amount down as much as possible. Uh, keep valuables locked uh, or in sight of. Uh, of windows so for those that do like jewelry or collector's items and stuff again it's in a glass case uh, that's actually locked and people aren't able to gain access to it without asking uh, for some help from an employee or something along those lines uh, schedule enough staff to perform the duty safely and consider more staff during peak times so we see this pretty often is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, the, the staffing uh, requirements or whatever are, are sometimes lower when it gets uh, a little bit busier. So it's always good to try to um, kind of pick out when when are my peak times and when should I have the most staff going um, is, is, is generally very helpful. And then uh, do not split purchases made uh, with the tap feature on a debit or credit card. Um, and watch out for individuals wanting to make mul multiple purchases. So what this is, is that they've stolen um, somebody's uh, card and what they will frequently do is go to any um, convenience store or any store in general and then make a whole bunch of purchases under like a certain limit, like whether it's $20 or $50 and buy a whole bunch of prepaid visas and they'll tap, tap, tap because it doesn't require that pin um, and they'll do it until they end up hitting the limit uh, for, for the day. So if you see people doing that or asking you to split purchases and they're not splitting it with somebody else that's actually there um, and they're just using the same card, stop that transaction right there. Don't allow them to do it because it's cl clearly that they're, they're just trying to run up the number on that actual card. Uh, if you're looking for more more tips and stuff, you can always go to StoreWatch on our edmontonpolice.ca uh, website. There's an entire section that our, our robbery se section does uh, to help commercial businesses and owners protect uh, their employees. Some other things that you can uh, uh, try to do is uh, keep a small amount, uh, small of a float as possible. Um, many sites can get by on as little as $50 with some coins. Um, we, we suggest a time delay on your safe, um, and ideally this is partnered with uh, signage. So if you haven't heard of this before, what this looks like is uh, if you punch in the code for the safe, 
there's a three minute time delay or a five minute time delay or whatever amount of time that you you're willing to wait the reason being is if there's signage to go along with this saying that there's a time delay for the actual safe for the for the site that means that if this person comes into uh, potentially do a, a robbery or anything like that and forces you to put it in the code for your actual safe and stuff, there's now a long delay. So there's going to be a three minute delay. Once you put the code in, the door doesn't actually open up for uh, that, that three to five minutes. Again, these guys want to get in and out or whatever as fast as they possibly can. That amount of time sitting there waiting for that uh, safe to open or whatever is not time they want to do because somebody's probably called it in by that point and a police officer's on their way and we're going to be there fairly quickly. Um, they're not willing to sit and wait minutes for that to open. It's a little bit of inconvenience on, a, on the time uh, delay side or whatever for you as an employee, but on the robbery side, if I see that signage on an actual pro uh, uh, for a property or for a business, uh, it's not going to be one that I'm going to want to potentially look at um, um, potentially doing a robbery or anything because of that delay, there's a high likelihood um, that I'm going to get caught. The other thing that you can do is if you have uh, employees that actually take um, their de deposits to the bank for you, ideally we want some, somebody to accompany you. Um, people do infrequently um, uh, try to canvas properties and stuff and try to figure out who's doing it. So the common one is every Friday at like 3 p.m. or at noon or something like that, the deposit goes out with the same person. So obviously varying times that you do it, varying the pattern, varying the person and stuff that's doing it too um, is also a, a good idea because we don't want people to pick up on that uh, specific pattern over and over and over again so that they know when is the most vulnerable time or whatever and when is the time that I should stop this person to try to take that deposit. We can go on to the next one. So company policies, uh, this will this has to do with what uh, uh, Stephen was talking uh, about earlier when it comes to video. So um, some things that you should uh, think about uh, is obviously having clear policies and standard training for all staff uh, and will help employees know how to respond uh, to issues or concerns. One of the things that we suggest is we limit, limit uh, public use and stuff uh, of washrooms by locking doors and, uh, and know where the public washrooms are available um, are in and around your business. If you go to uh, data.edmonton.ca, you can actually look up that information and find out where the closest public washroom is, and then you can direct people uh, there. Because obviously, um, especially in the downtown core, um, we won't run into a lot of problems with, uh, fortunately, drugs and, uh, and, and uh, that type of paraphernalia being used within those washrooms. We want to train staff on uh, safety protocols. So we want to have an emergency plan uh, in place in case something happens and encourage, uh, we, it helps to encourage positive interactions uh, with customers. So, um, and Stephen already alluded to it once, uh, Liquor Depot says hi to every customer that comes in the door. Again, these guys don't want to be seen if they're trying to be sneaky or anything like that. They don't want to be engaged because they don't want somebody to remember anything about them. They want to get in and get out and have almost zero interaction uh, with people uh, as possible. Uh, I, uh, one of the things that uh, um, we talk about when it comes to uh, the video side of things. So uh, when you call in or whatever, and let's say the worst has happened, somebody's come in and robbed rob the place or whatever, and now the, the person has fled. As a police officer, timeliness of information is really, really key. So what we run into frequently with businesses is only the uh, building uh, manager or the owner or somebody like that has access to the uh, video surveillance for the property. What we do as police officers is we generally send a car or two or whatever to the actual location to secure the location and make sure that everybody's okay. But their main goal when they get there is to try to get a description or even better, a picture of the person that did the actual robbery because the rest of the police officers will actually be circulating the area trying to find that person. But in the meantime, if we don't have a description of the person or if we don't have a picture, it becomes very difficult to do so. The best thing we can get is that picture. So if we can get there and all staff or all employees are able to uh, get gain access to the video surveillance uh, for us, 
then we can get that picture out to uh, members that are patrolling the area and potentially pick up that person. Now, if we get there and only the manager has access to do this and it takes the manager three hours to get there, well, that person's probably long gone and our chances of actually picking them up at that actual scene or, or right after that crime has been done is now drastically reduced down to almost nothing. We can still figure it out uh, potentially who they are from other investigative techniques, but actually catching them right after they do it and catching them with uh, your product or, or, or whatever it is that they stole, um, is it becomes very difficult if we don't have that timely information. So make sure that you, you do uh, train up staff if you have cameras, have somebody on shift, at least one person that knows. We always suggest that everybody knows. And then again, just walk through with them. Uh, what do we do if something is to happen? So if a robbery happened, um, you need to, you can have assigned rules. One person locks the door, another person calls the police and they provide the description, description of the person while the other person who locked the door is trying to provide a direction of travel of where this person went. Having that plan in place makes a, a an, abs uh, an insane amount of difference when uh, that information comes into us. If we have a direction of travel, a potential vehicle that they fled on, did they flee on foot, did they flee on a bike, did, uh, what they were wearing or anything, basic description, then we get there and we get more pictures. The likelihood of this person being caught is, is just so much so much greater. So take the time uh, to do it. It uh, helps, uh, helps us out a ton. All right, so uh, back alley safety. Um, back alleys are a common target for crime and disorder. Um, keeping it well lit and, cl and clean will decrease the chance of your business being a target. So uh, keeping gates and locks cleaned, um, as well as dumpsters. Um, recently, we've had a few businesses who've had some issues around the dumpsters, and uh, fortunately, not one of the, the dumpsters were locked. So keeping a lock on there and only opening it up when you're using it is uh, recommended. Um, report burnt out city light bulbs to 311 immediately. Um, you can see in the picture on the top there that uh, it, it's not really well lit and that may be because there's just a lack of lighting or some of uh, some bulbs are burnt out. Um, install motion sensor lighting um, behind your business. So a lot of times we don't have that power at specific spots of the building. Um, so using the solar lights um, are a really good idea. Um, you can get them lots of different places and they are quite bright. The panels are, are quite large as well. So uh, they work really well. Um, keeping your alley clean, of course, so really getting into that maintenance and broken window theory is, you know, picking up the garbage, uh, making sure um, recycled items are where they should be, um, doing that walk around like I had mentioned in the morning or the evening, um, just to pick up any uh, garbage or see what's going on around the business. Always post your address at the back, and I had mentioned that already, um, but uh, on, on the back alley safety thing, that's uh, it's really important to have that address at the back just so EBS can access the back door and know which business to go into quicker if they need to um, come for help. Um, an exterior camera at the back uh, is also advisable and allows staff to ensure the rear premise is safe before opening the back door. Um, if you can't have a camera in the back, a peephole in the door is also a good idea. Um, and uh, if, uh, if you need to, you can have deliveries come to the front of the, of the building if the back alley isn't uh, is safe to do so. Um, so um, really that animation and, and beautification maintenance piece, um, just to highlight that for the back alley as well, you see um, in the photo on the bottom there, um, that's um, a back alley just off White Avenue. Um, you can see that the business owner on the right side put out some tables and chairs. And then of course you can see that the, the street is painted. Um, people um, are attracted to spaces like that. So having more people in those spaces will reduce crime as there's more eyes on the street. Personal safety. So pay attention to people who visit your business um, and their purpose of their visit. Of their visit. So train staff to report. Um, a lot of incidents go unreported. So make sure that staff know how to report and when to report. Of course, if it's an emergency, uh, 911 as always. If it's a non-emergency, you can call the EPS non-emergency line at 423-4567 or also Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Um, be aware of your surroundings. 
Um, so pay attention to people who ask about your business operations, security procedures, shift changes, uh, observe your building for a prolonged period of time and or are uh, loitering outside without explanation. Watch for people who are wearing hats, um, kind of low hats to kind of cover their, their face or sunglasses inside. Um, people who bring in large bags or backpacks into the store. And also people that are parked in their cars outside who are observing your business uh, for a prolonged period of time. Record the license plate of suspicious vehicles. Uh, we only uh, recommend this if it's safe to do so. You, you definitely don't want to be approaching anyone's vehicle, especially if someone's inside and taking photos of it. Um, if it's safe, uh, you can take a photo to provide to EPS. If not, um, just don't do it. Uh, ensure staff are aware of emergency exit routes and safety protocol um, should there be an incident uh, that occurs. And walk with a partner at nighttime um, uh, or um, to check out hidden spots. So always having that person with you. Um, if there isn't an opportunity for a second person, um, keep your phone with you. Um, and then walking to your car after work, if you're doing it by yourself, try to park in well-lit areas. Um, maybe do a, a look out the window just to see if there's anyone out there that uh, you don't really want to chat with or come into contact with before you're going to your uh, vehicle after your shift. So securing your vehicle at work, it's really important to secure your vehicle. Um, many times business owners cannot be held accountable for um, your biz or your vehicle at work. So of course, always lock your vehicle number one, um, but also don't forget to close the windows, um, take keys with you, um, never leave your car unattended while it's running, um, and consider using a bar lock um, for the steering wheel. Keep valuables out of sight or completely remove them, um, which would be the first thing to do. Um, so, for example, garage door openers, you want to take them out. Uh, phone chargers, uh, it may feel insignificant, but, um, you know, someone will or someone may uh, break your window just for a phone charger. Um, also, vehicle registration, uh, change uh, in your cup holders or uh, sunglasses on the dash, any of those things you want to make sure that they're removed or um, out of sight. Um, use an alarm sticker. Um, you can pick up these alarm stickers, I believe, at all EPS locations. So it says on the sticker, all valuables removed. So, you know, if someone is trying to um, taking the chance that maybe there's something in there, they break the window. This may stop them from breaking the window to see if there's something in there. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, they should be available at all police stations. And I had touched on already parking well lit areas for um, if you work uh, at nighttime and you're walking to your vehicle after dark. Aggressive panhandling. So ensure employees are aware of how to respond to aggressive panhandling. Um, reporting aggressive panhandling in progress allows EPS to respond more efficiently. Um, so uh, you can have a conversation with um, those individuals who are asking for money um, and see what it is they're struggling with um, and say that is food insecurity. Um, you can refer them to 211, sorry, and um, that is a service that uh, will help them find that appropriate resource or support that they need, whatever that might be. Um, so that's a, a one option, just so you're not giving out uh, money to people. Um, you can also donate to a charity. Say if you um, if you do enjoy giving money to people, um, uh, an, uh, an option would be to donate to charity. That way you know um, that you're supporting those individuals and you know where the money is going to and it's being uh, spent on the right, right things. Um, of course, if there is an emergency, always call 911. Um, if there is a, a non-emergency, you can call EPS non-emergency, and that's 423-4567. Um, and also, if you see uh, someone who's in a crisis outside, especially during the winter hours, um, you can call the crisis, uh, the 24-7 crisis diversion team, which is also at 211. I believe it's 211 press 2 or 3. It's either one of those. Um, but you can, uh, you can call them, and, uh, and many times they will come out and uh, help support that person who's in crisis.
All right, so there is a video here on the screen and I'm just going to um, mute myself and then I'm going to play it. Um, I had mentioned the crisis diversion team um, and uh, this is a video that they've come up with and uh, uh, they, they showcase a scenario of an individual who is um, in crisis and uh, needing some extra support and help. Um, so this is a business um, who is responding and it shows you the steps that they take. Um, so since this is a recording, we are unable to have a discussion after this, um, after I play the video. However, if you have any uh, comments or anything like that, please uh, feel free to email that to myself or Kenny. So just give me a second here and I'm going to get it running. I'll let you know if we have any issues this time. When we see people either in distress or uh, in a position where they need help, we can use the uh, 211 line and uh, get the help that they need. Howdy. Um, there's a guy about halfway down the LRT stairs there that looks like he needs some help or something. Okay, I'll go have a look at him. Okay. It was, it was fantastic that a customer approached Mark and let him know that there was somebody outside the store that, you know, may be in hey. distress. Hey, buddy. You okay? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Can't sleep. Can't sleep. I'll get you some help. Can't sleep. 24-7 Crisis Diversion Team Dispatch. Emma speaking. How can I help you? My name is Emma Potter. I'm the acting manager of the Helplines program at the Canadian Mental Health Association, Edmonton Region. So we're taking about 1,300 calls a month related to crisis diversion. Is he safe right now? Do you feel like he needs any police or, or medical assistance? If, if we see that uh, an individual is in distress and you know they're not in danger of hurting themselves or others immediately, uh, but they are in a situation of crisis, then I think that uh, uh, a time where we can take that opportunity to use 211. A service like this matters because we want to make sure that people are getting the help, the appropriate help for what they're needing. And so we want to make sure that if something does need to go to the police or to EMS, that it's going there. But if it, we really don't need police involvement or ambulance involvement, we can get that community support out there to that person, especially those experiencing mental illness, because we do know that mental illness is overrepresented in our vulnerable and homeless population. Twenty four seven Crisis Diversion is a collaborative partnership including Boyle Street Community Services, Hope Mission, Canadian Mental Health Association two one one, Edmonton Police Service, Alberta Health Services, Emergency Medical Services, and Reach Edmonton. All right. So that's a good video, uh, a really great service. Um, so please consider um, calling them if you do uh, uh, witness someone who is struggling or may need a little bit of extra support. Just go. All right, so um, just to uh, touch on some who to call resources and things like that, so I did, um, I did mention two-on-one -on -one for vulnerable people or any resources or supports that uh, you may want to refer someone to or even yourself. Um, Crime Stoppers I've touched on as well and there's the phone number. Please feel free to take a photo of your screen for any of these numbers. Um, Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre is there as well. Um, reporting online, so you can report online now. Um, and uh, those are the reasons they're listed that you can report online. So break and enter to a detached garage or shed, um, damage to a property, damage to a vehicle, lost property, 
theft of property from vehicle under $5,000 or theft under $5,000. Um, again, uh, the EPS non-emergency line is 423-4567. Or if, you want, if you're on a mobile phone or cell phone, um, you can go uh, pound 377. Um, and uh, that will also connect you to the non-emergency line. Uh, so that concludes our presentation. Um, our emails are there. So mine's at the top there, Stephen Quinn, and uh, Kenny's is just right underneath. Um, again, there is that QR code there. So um, please uh, fill that uh, survey out uh, and, and provide us some feedback. Um, let us know what worked, uh, what didn't work, uh, what we can do better next time. Um, again, if that uh, <clears throat> QR code isn't working for you, uh, you can put in that, uh, that website that's provided below and uh, that will direct you to the survey as well. Um, but um, thank you so much for uh, viewing our presentation today and we really appreciate you uh, tuning in and helping contribute to reducing crime in your communities and around your business. So thanks. Take care. Thank you.